Good afternoon, everybody. I didn't tell Jean-Claude, but my grandfather was one of the people who built the Titanic. Uh, so I'm not sure there's a very good family precedent there in terms of foresight, but he did always say it wasn't the design, it was the direction. Um, and I think there's something in that. I want to thank uh, our hosts for being, giving us this opportunity. It is great when you're in the... Br I'm kind of on the bridge between policy and science, uh, which is a complicated p place to be at the moment, and it's great to come to a place like this where there is inspiration and vision, uh, where you see that hope is something that has to be earned through hard work and collaboration and cooperation. So thanks to our hosts, and congratulations to our colleagues, the National Champions. It was brilliant uh, to listen to you uh, this morning and today. So I work on the European Commission, the Research and Innovation Department. It's called Healthy Planet, where I work. We've got a big budget. We have basically limitless access to the brains of the world, to our partners. And our job is to set a direction for research and innovation that it works uh, alongside the direction that's been set out by people like Johan Rockström and others. Uh, the people who work in the IPCC, in IPBES, on water, oceans, most of the Earth systems are working uh, where I have the privilege to work. And we're at a key moment. And so what I'd like to basically focus on is three things uh, responding to the two questions that we were given. Um, that's the problem with uh, European officials. We tend to read things. Uh, an Irish official, by the way, is defined as somebody who talks very quickly in other people's sleep. Um, so there we go. Um, I want to say three things. We really need to pay attention to the specificity of this particular moment. Uh, we are in a very, very difficult and important moment for a number of different reasons. Um, the macro is what we've seen uh, Johan present, which is the context, the tipping points, um, where we see that we are, where we see that we're going. Um, we're in a situation where, as a science community, uh, we refer to ourselves where I work as the class of 29. Uh, we have to have ready for 2030 the scientific infrastructure, data, uh, applications, uh, the ability to monitor, to underpin the legislation that's been put in place, the ability to inform those who will take innovation forward, those who will make policy, those who will de-risk finance, those who will set the direction for the economy in the coming years. We need that in place by the end of this decade, or we're all going to start missing uh, our targets. So consider yourself to have graduated also into the class of 29. And one of the things we need to think about is what has to be done there. But there's a specificity about this moment. Do we know what we need to be ready at the end of this decade? We're at a political moment. Half the world is voting, uh, voting for all kinds of different reasons in different ways. One of the most dispiriting things, looking at young people in the room, is the number of young people who are buying the BS that is being sold by populists and people who don't believe in science and don't believe in your futures. But that's a failure on our generation. So there's an intergenerational risk that we are specifically running that must not widen and it must be addressed, not simply by reinforcing the careers of uh, early researchers, but also by looking at the intergenerationality of rights. The fact that your rights in the future can be taken away by my inaction now. We need to do some serious work, but that is a specific context. And the other context is that people, not everybody has actually been, had their lives transformed by the planetary boundaries, the brilliant work of the planetary boundaries. They think that they're in a political, you'd call it a candy store, I think, where we can do climate over here because it's a societal risk, but we can't do land use over there. This is a really big political challenge for us to try and make them understand that there's a very positive option, but it's an integrated approach and a systems approach. The second thing I want to talk about is that we need to deliver this transition by design, so it has to be science and innovation, working towards goals, making priorities, setting direction. Uh, and to do that, we need mission thinking. We need to think about the way people have done great achievements uh, in, in science, uh, in society, uh, over time. Clear outcomes, mobilization of the public, the use of intellectual resources, partnering up in different ways. This is a great initiative here. You see a foundation of people enabling a conversation like that but really mobilizing people, because this is the key thing that's coming out of the conversation. It's the people who control the access to Johan's corridor. And the people are not opening the access to Johan's corridor at the moment. We're not here working for the planet. The planet will survive us, ultimately. But if we want to get to the narrow corridor with people north and south, east and west, the people have to be involved. So we need a mission-based approach. And the third point linked to that is, as we're seeing, transition by design will require transition by consent. And that's a challenge when you are brilliant natural scientists 
to bring and integrate the critical parts of how decisions are made and received from the social sciences, from political science, behavioral science, and so forth, to try and integrate that into how we think about not what we need to do, because the next few years is about how are we going to do it, with whom are we going to do it, and some of the brilliant stuff we saw today about the specification of things, even like biodiversity. Where are we going to do it? Where, where are the leverage points of the risks and so forth? So in a word, and an Irishman can't count, science is nature's diplomacy. Uh, nature doesn't have uh, a, a voice. Science is that voice, and science is that voice now. And this community of people who are working to make the planetary boundaries from an aspiration into a place need to be heard, and need to be heard quite specifically, and need to be heard in the coming months. And I'm not talking about the protests and so forth. It's about making the science and the narrative and what you know and, and the inevitability, make it inevitable that this has to be taken forward as an integrated approach. Um, when we look at the Green Deal, some of you will know the European Union Green Deal. At the moment, in the political game, people are trying to say the Green Deal was some kind of a policy. The Green Deal wasn't a policy. The Green Deal is a purpose. It's a refounding of the European Union. It is what the European Union is for. It's to 2050 and beyond. The European Union was founded to make peace between warring nations through steel and then through markets and then through the reintegration of countries. The Eurozone, I think people are still out on that one. Um, and this one is to make peace with nature. That's the purpose of the European Union. That's what the Green Deal is about. And on the different sides of politics, they'll try and pick things off and say, well, it's just a policy agenda. And now, for something completely different, we move on to uh, something else. No. It is the purpose of the European Union. But the difficulty is, having done more than 50 pieces of regulation, it's quite extraordinary what's been achieved. Uh, and there are about 10 pages of targets. So probably some uh, communication challenge there. How are the people who have to live with this going to do it? How do the farmers, or the, the people in the forestry situation, the people responsible for the rivers and so forth, how are they supposed to do this? And they're expecting your community to have answers to that. What kind of integrated data systems do you need to do observation, monitoring, prediction for a, something as complex as a water system? Or an ocean system, I work with the ocean system. And there are examples. Uh, two or three weeks ago, we launched a thing called the Digital Twin of the Ocean, which President von der Leyen had asked us to create with President Macron a couple of years ago, mobilize the community. It's an extraordinary thing. It's a bringing together of all of the different kind of biogeochemical observational systems and organizations, the, the available models, uh, prediction, even uh, 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 citizen reported science, indigenous science and so forth. Uh, and the, the idea is to develop something which moves from being a scientific infrastructure for scientists to a scientific infrastructure for public policy decision making that looks at the user's needs. So we need to, for example, uh, reforest a, a seagrass meadow. What, how, do we, how do we do that? We need to report, let's imagine we wanted to do na nature restoration, which is the case in many places. What's the baseline? How do we measure things? How do we do risk assessment? You know, when you get down to some of the fantastic ideas you hear, you hear today, how are we going to convince people that it's safe to do this? All of these things have to be thought about in different branches of science uh, and policy. But at least we've now, within two years, created something which can become, it's a kind of a space and time machine because you can start to look and see what is actually happening. Where are the mammals? What happens if the plastics go in here? It's play space, it's usable. And we look at particular cases where decision makers need to know where do we build our cities? You know, what is happening with the fisheries? What is the consequence of heating or plastics or whatever? So we need to start finding these public policy infrastructures that are currently seen as scientifically uh, uh, critical areas. The Green Deal um, has received what we call a green lash, uh, which is absolutely to be expected. Um, and some of it is political. Um, and some of it is people really struggling with the challenges that they have. And so we need to find ways, if we're going to do this transition by, de by design, so we have laws, we have completely reoriented what the European Union can and will invest in, like the massive amount of money that the European Union is involved in investing, it has a thing called its own taxonomy, it's borrowed a good word from, from you. Uh, the direction of travel in terms of financing, programs, enforcement, international cooperation, everything the European Union is about is pointing in that direction. 
But we have a green light because people have to live with it. Farmers have to try and do things that they don't have the means to do. So that's the space that we need to be concentrating uh, in, 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 in doing things like the nature restoration law. Nature restoration law, we were talking about this the other day. Young people in the room, people will tell you that history kind of things happen, they just happen, and people don't make a difference. So there's one Austrian woman who stood up in the Council of the European Union a couple of weeks ago, and in conscience, she voted in favour of the nature restoration law. Now, the woman actually should be given an award herself, Leonora Genesler, that's probably a terrible pronunciation. We actually had a problem because then Austria actually said she wasn't representing the Austrian position, this is not legal and institutional, and we learned something legally that in fact it was, so congratulations to you. But because of that, the balance on the nature restoration law meant that it was passed. It's not as strong as it was, but it's there. So there's now an inevitability, and in law, we need to enforce 20% land and sea restoration with 2030, 3 billion trees, 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers, pollinator decline indicators, border life decline, etc., etc., etc. So now the question from the politicians is, how do we do this? And they turn to people like me and say, you must have something in your cupboard there with all this money we've been giving you for the last 20 years. And we turn around to you, the scientific community, and say, well, so that's the gap that we have to close in the next couple of years. Transition by design is going to require a massive mobilization. That's where I come as examples to the missions. And this is just, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the missions are examples of what's actually already happening. The other thing is to remember that, I mean, the distance between where we were five or six years ago and where we are now is extraordinary in terms of policy and assumptions. So nothing is inevitable if you can bring your best game to the floor. Now, these missions were an attempt uh, set out initially by Carlos Muedas to try and connect people with the goals through inspiration, taking research and innovation, and seeing can you work on the key issue, Johan said, can we scale and can we accelerate, can we demonstrate, can we localize, can we make into part of the economy what these challenges are. We've got four big ones in the Green Deal area. Restore our oceans and waters by 2030, and that's practical stuff. 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing free rivers. The restoration of actual coastlines, the actual reforestation of seagrass, meadows, kelp forests. Um, we're building it on communities, communities of islands, ports, coastal rivers, regions. Uh, different communities have formed. Hundreds and hundreds of people have signed the charter to take part. There is a public out there that wants this to change. And the mission has to actually deliver on the practical concept, but it does it by working from science with communities in four lighthouses, sea basins, actual places where you sit down with the fisheries community and everybody else and work out where should the marine protected area be. And for things like that, we, need, we turn around and say, well, where's the science that we have and where do we start? Um, the climate adaptation mission, I won't go into too much detail, Johan Rockström and actually uh, Jean-Pascal von Ypresela also were members of the board there. Again, this is to operationalize how are we going to build risk resilience in 150 regions in Europe. So give them the means to actually work out what their specific risks are with science and technology, pilot the solutions, you know, get the finance and the, the, the other aspects in, demonstrate. So if you're in a fire at risk or a flooding risk or whatever, you've actually been able to work with science to work the answers out. And the same again on soil. There's a soil mission which is trying to restore the quality of soil in three quarters of the, of the lands of Europe. And that's where the soil erosion and the, the, the alternatives to pesticides and all of these solutions that are affecting the nutrient flow, the water, so much of what's up here on the planetary boundaries will be practiced and tested in practical ways. Because for a lot of people who are not, you know, flying around from one continent to the other, sitting on their farms in different parts of Europe, seeing is believing, can I actually have a family farm in a rural community doing all these things, and how do we do that? So the Soil Mission has 100 uh, living labs with thousands of actual sites in all over Europe trying to work out these issues. So that's the... Um, I know there's supposed to be a slide in there, it's okay. I just should put up, make myself popular. Um, I invite you to have a look at these, and I invite you to connect. So consider my... I was very delighted to have a chance here to be with you, but consider this an, uh, uh, an invitation to connect. I'm astonished when I listen to the participation, how much of what's going on here can be connected into partnerships and activities that we have created within the European Union, our neighborhood, and with our international partners. And the last point is about these climate, uh, 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 these missions, is about the need for 
uh, connection and the need for consent. So one of the most important things is actually how you go about developing change. And there needs to be different ways of looking at that and why people are attached. People are attached to different things in different ways. And that's why we need the social sciences. We have things like climate assemblies and so forth that are being tried and tested. We need to find what does governance look like at the local level? How do you work in the way in which people inform their problems and their decisions, not just at national level? And that's part of what has to, what has to happen. Now, to stop, I actually listened to the questions that was asked. I mean, the, I have a, one comment to make, that the two questions we have about the next research agenda and amplification transfer, you can't have one without the other. We need both. Um, we're at a critical point in the European Union where we're about to just define what the next framework program will be. So we need people to be active in that space. So I would say in terms of where we're going, we need mission-type campaigns in a number of areas that have been identified by our scientists. For example, a remarkable project on the microbiome. You know, the microbiome, if it's, if it's actually applied uh, is systemically by the end of the decade, could be a complete and transformative game changer as the human genome was uh, a generation ago. Why don't we just get together and do it? We have a number of parts of the world that actually have different programs. Um, the map of life, fantastic. It's extraordinary. I do a lot of work with people in the oceans. Uh, and it's extraordinary what we think it's okay not to know. It's just ridiculous. So like one of the things we set ourselves a target is like, what is it that we should know? So what would the actual map of like, what should it look like for human societies by the end of this decade, by the end of 2040? And then let's just do it and go all the, the whole way down. I, I love the word tax. I haven't heard that for a while. Um, I mentioned the fact that we need to work on what are the actual infrastructures that science creates. I'll give you the DTO, the Digital Twin of the Ocean, as an example, that public policy will need to implement these things. Somewhere in there, people have to be thinking about this and be ready. I want to really, many people talked about the need for the data organizational needs, and open science, as you now know, is not, uh, 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 is, is not a secret uh, as to how we're going to transform this. It's critical, but it seems as if there's something that needs to be done. If we're going to have cathedral thinking, we need data cathedrals. Uh, to allow the pilgrims to enter and find their way and, and take things forward. I want to emphasize this. The intergenerational needs are being, I think, not properly taken into consideration. We are at risk, and I was quite relieved to hear that we weren't actually in the Anthropocene. That was a close one. Um, the, the risks that we have, and you see this, I say very often that anxiety is not a policy, but that's okay for my generation to say. We risk if we don't actually start looking at the rights of different generations, the ones who are here, the ones to come, as an issue of human rights, and that that's something that the, the, the social science should look at, the intergenerationality of rights and the theories of human rights and the capabilities that need to be put in place so that current and future people are able to have a reasonable expectation of what they, they should have. And then for the living generation, that our generation of people in scientific organizations should put a massive effort into enabling and, and upscaling the capabilities of our early stage career researchers around the world, particularly in places where they don't have a lot of finance, to actually accelerate their knowledge, because they're going to be asked to do a lot quite quickly. And at the very end, we need to globalize everything. And by that, I don't mean globalization in terms of the way in which we need to make sure that everything we do is accessible, usable, and directable by the people who need it most. And there I will finish with something I do like to say, which is science, and particularly science at this moment, has a duty to give courage to politics, hope to citizens, space to innovators, and respite to nature. And that is what I've seen here today, and congratulations and thank you.